Hi, my name is Dennis Mansell. Today's talk is going to be on refactoring. And you can see sometimes we actually have to live in a house at the same time as we're remodeling it. And uh, refactoring is a lot like this. This talk will discuss software development and software engineering. It'll discuss the nuts and bolts of developing software products, oops, software products, and the science of building good systems at a reasonable cost. All right, part of the software process is making changes to existing code and refactoring is a tool that actually helps us do this well. Refactoring is a technique to make changes safely. And you can see in the box here, refactoring is the process of making improvements to the structure of a code without changing its functionality. So your focus is on making changes that improve the structure, but you don't want to change the functionality. Does this sound like a kind of an extreme thing to do? Sure. But when we add to existing software applications, we may do some refactoring first, and then we'll do some extensions of the code, and we will change the functionality. So we'll go back and forth. All right. So thinking about the changes we make to software, right? Suppose that we're in the business of creating tax preparation software. What changes? Well, tax tables change every year. Uh, the rules on tax deductions change. Uh, uh, maybe we have new information about the user that we're maintaining. Uh, we have changes in the formulas for computing uh, tax return fields. Uh, and we might have changes to the filing process, right? You know, changes in the printed forms, changes to the electronic submission process, okay? Ah, so, um, oops, sorry. Another area, right? We may be building applications to help people create and post online videos, right? And it will need to work with various kinds of recording, video recording apps, right? And those, of course, are changing all the time, right? Uh, <laughs> it seems like you have a new uh, video recording application each month, right? And uh, uh, for uploading, right, each social media site has different rules about the way that their, uh, their, their stuff works. OK, hold on here. I am going to. Just take a look here. Because somebody is tip tap typing. Here we go. Maybe that's it. Okay. Good. All righty. Okay, so it's inevitable in these kinds of applications, tax preparation, uh, video editing, that we're gonna have changes, right? Uh, here's another one which is close to my heart, which is telecom software. I used to work in this industry, right? I used to work on the development of software for, for, for various kinds of telecom operations. You know, we would do, um, you know, uh, network management systems and so on. And customer, managers and customers always wanted something new. But of course, the old features must still work. We had things like provisioning, alarms, event logs that we're processing, and network management tools looking for, for potential bottlenecks. Well, management wanted the new stuff to be great, but sometimes we had to do some work to shore up the old stuff, right? So, hmm, wait a minute. I thought software doesn't wear out. It's the advantage of software over hardware, right? You know, you don't actually have bit decay, right? 
why do we ever need change software? Well, it's because some of the changes are related to bug fixes. You know, it's problems that we had when we actually originally developed the application. And sometimes it's new requirements that come in that we didn't know about last year when we were building the software, right? You know, what's the, what's the new tax formula gonna be? Yeah, we didn't know, right? Sometimes we have to make changes in order to port something to work in a new operating system, right? Um, yeah, have you ever used an old cell phone app and it doesn't work, it crashes? Well, did you load a new version of iOS on your iPhone or a new version of Android on your, on your Android phone? Yeah, that might be the root cause. So, yeah. Um, we really have three different kinds of changes and we've known this for a while. I'm, I'm, I'm quoting here uh, uh, Linson Swanson in their, their, their book on uh, software maintenance from 1980. And they said, hey, there are three different kinds of changes that happen in our software. There's corrective changes like the bug fixes. There's perfective changes, which are, you know, we, we've got, you know, new requirements that are coming in. And then there are adaptive changes like those, oh, you know, somebody upgraded the operating system, we better fix our application so that it can use it. Yeah. The only time an application stops changing is when it's dead, right? Dead and buried. So how do we think about making changes and how do we think about refactoring? We want to make changes safer. So it turns out there are three really important slides in this presentation. And you can tell they're important because they have a little star up here in the corner, right? The star says, hey, remember this. So refactoring doesn't necessarily have the same meaning to everybody. There's really four different camps. There's the software evolution camp. There's the agile development camp. There's the patterns camp. And there's the legacy code analysis camp. And we're going to talk about all four of these in this talk, right? Camp one is focused on the evolution of your application, like my telecom friends you know, would have this problem. Camp two, the focus is on being agile, working in short iterative cycles. Camp three, we're expanding beyond just simple code changes and we're looking at improvements in design, applying software patterns. And camp four is all about how we can use refactoring as a tool to help understand old code. So each group is trying to do something different, but it's still called refactoring. So consider the fact that refactoring may have different goals. Okay, so the software evolution camp is home turf for the folks we call maintenance programmers. Now, maintenance programmers are some of my favorite people, right? It's they're my favorite people because they're really smart, right? They open up the hood right, of existing code, and they know the best ways to go in and fix and extend the code. Legacy code, right, old code that, you know, somebody, you know, wrote and, you know, they're gone and, you know, now they've been abandoned. Now, legacy code is not a dirty word to them because legacy code is code that makes money for the company still. It would take an enormous amount of effort to build a new system with all of the expertise that went into building it. So, hey, repair and extending code is definitely something that's worth the effort. And in doing maintenance programming, refactoring is the process of making selective small changes, you can see, right? And testing to make sure that things still work. So, when you're refactoring, you're not a hacker. Hackers ag aggressively blow up code. Maintenance programmers change things slowly and well. When you spot a bug, you may say, oh, I'm gonna gently improve the code around it with some refactoring, all the while testing to make sure that, I, that the functionality is still the same. And then when I fix it, I say, oh, okay, now I'll make a one or two line change 
And yeah, that's just going to fix the problem that, that I'm trying to fix the bug for. So the refactoring work is the preparation to make the fix simple and to make sure that it stays fixed. And we may actually do some other selective uh, code improvements like renaming, minor restructuring, uh, splitting, adding internal interfaces. Now, this is actually the kind of work that maintenance programmers have been doing forever, right? But the first refactoring tools actually started appearing in 1990. And it was my old friend, Bill Updike. Uh, Bill worked for, for Bell Labs in Illinois. And he actually left uh, Bell Labs and, and went back to University of Illinois for his uh, doctorate degree. And he did a series of papers with Ralph Johnson, one of the patterns guys. And he did his dissertation on a, a set of refactoring tools. And other people picked up on the idea and they said, oh, we're gonna put refactoring into some of our code browsers and code editors and stuff like that. And from that point on, this idea of making changes safely got a name. It was became known as refactoring. So in refactoring in camp one, it's focused. It's focused, you refactor only when you, where you planned to make changes soon. You can wanna make sure that the code is clear and understandable before you make the fixes. Thinking of it, thinking of it as fixing our mistakes. Uh, for example, right, you might have a system, right, that's doing all kinds of ordering and shipping products where your database runs on customer name, right? And, but somewhere along the line, you said, oh, we're actually gonna add a customer ID. And the customer ID is an extra field that, you know, just make sure that, that the customer information is unique, right? But um, all around the system, you have searches on customer name, or is it customer ID? Huh. I don't know, it's a mess, right? You're looking through the code and you can't tell. So what we do is we say, let's back up. Let, we're gonna refactor slowly to create search by customer name functions and search by customer ID functions, clearly labeled, and then slowly replace the code, which has lots of ad hoc queries all the way through it to use those new functions that we extract, right? So that it's clear at a glance, we look at this code and we say, oh, that is the kind of search that's actually taking place here. Okay, so yeah, that's the kind of clarification that happens all the time in refactoring. Now, camp two, we're gonna talk about agile developers and agile development. Agile is really a movement within the business of developing commercial software products that started in the mid 1990s. It became very popular for developing web-based software, for building mobile apps, right? Because you're building lots of things that are small and you need to get them done quick, right? The chief characteristics of agile development are small teams. Maybe you'll have three to 10 people on a team, right? It's not our big, you know, Bell Labs, uh, uh, AT&T, you know, 100 person, 180 person project. No, small. And the team is building small features in a couple of weeks and they keep iterating to build a bigger product, right? Um, and of course they keep talking to the customers because what they're doing is they're helping to set priorities. Which things do the customers want first? Which is most important to them, right? So what happens in this environment, and this is the this is this second block here, any work that you do early will need to evolve. You'll have some rewriting done on it, right? Uh, because you're always starting with a few small features and they're incomplete and you're expanding them to whatever the customer really wants. So you might be changing course if the customers change their mind. Notice that ag oops, sorry, agile developers use continuous integration to compile and check their work frequently, uh, fixing small problems. And agile development uses refactoring all the time in every iteration and frequent building and testing too. 
So this is where building unit tests gets to be important. It helps to support safer refactoring. By the way, as a side note, Agile teams are in the habit of using a version control system or a change control system for all of their code to build automated, uh, support automated build and automated testing. So you can see over here on the side, you know, you might be, you might use Subversion, you might use Mercurial, you might use Get, and all your code is kind of, you know, being checked in there. So you can always go back to a previous version. You can, you know, you can make a little branch and say, oh, I'll try this out over on the branch and then merge it back in, right? So this change control is a big help in the step-by-step -step refactoring process. All right, so unit testing and refactoring go hand in hand. Evaluating software after each small change, you have an investment in unit tests. You'll see agile developers use test-driven development. Test-driven development is a little strange. You're running some unit tests every few minutes while you're coding, right? You're making small changes to implement a new feature and you're developing the tests at the same time. In fact, what you do is you, you put in a test that you know is gonna fail, right? But you wanna have it succeed, but you haven't written the code for it yet. So you put it in, you check to make sure that it actually does fail, and then you develop just enough code so that that test passes. And then of course you check all of the other tests to make sure that you haven't inadvertently broken anything else. This test-driven development is a common uh, technique in, in these, these fast operating, iterative, agile development projects. And it's a good discipline. Without good tests, developers get sloppy. By the way, you might want to learn how to write unit tests, right? Maybe with one of these unit test frameworks that I've indicated over here on the right, right? Uh, JUnit for Java, Jest for, for JavaScript, right? PyUnit, maybe for, for Python, right? This, this, you know, many languages have these, these simple unit test frameworks that makes it easy to plug in small tests and have them run automatically. Cool. Okay, so I said before, what's the strategy to decide what needs to be refactored? Well, in camp one, it's, you know, you're thinking about what's gonna change next, but you can't afford to do that in Agile because, you know, hey, next week you may be working on something that you didn't think you'd be working on. Okay, so in Agile, what you tend to do is use code smells to determine you know, which kinds of refactorings might actually be helpful. The code smells are standard code quality issues. And you have various uh, catalogs of code smells, you know, if you, if you don't know them, you know, you can, you can, you can uh, find some of these things on the internet. But remember, I said that if there's a little star up in the corner of the slide, this is like something that's really, really important. Well, guess what? This is really, really important. Okay. Use your judgment. Okay. Somebody, some, you know, code smell will say, oh, well, large function, large functions are bad how large is large, right? And is this particular function an exception, right? Don't refactor something just because the experts say that you must follow their coding rules because you'll never finish. Your judgment should be your guide. It's your decision what you wanna work on today. Cool. So here's some code smells, right? These are some of the function level code smells. And by the way, there's easy refactorings to go with each of the smells. In general, you'll see from these, these, um, these code smells, they're often about length and or complexity that makes something smell not so good, right? Too many parameters, long function, right? Excessive comments, right? Comments should be short and sweet and they should always tell the truth. Oh, I wish. All right. There are also code smells that apply across functions, right? Where you might have to look in multiple source files to trace down problems. For instance, you know, you have a bunch of, of code 
where you know you're working over here and you're saying, oh, I'm calling this thing that's over here, and the name is totally mysterious. You know, I you know, <laughs> it's, it's a terrible name for a function, right? You should the, the name should reflect its purpose, right? And and it's usually because you you know the person who wrote it, yeah, they knew exactly what they were talking about, but the people who are working off on on other parts of the system, yeah, they don't know. Um, this could also cause you problems later on when you actually look at the code six months later and you say, what does this do? I've forgotten. Yeah, so good name helps, right? But duplicated code is, some, is another place where you have to look across multiple functions to find places where you're really doing the same thing. Now, this actually makes your system brittle because what will happen is somebody will find a bug, right? And they say, oh, I'll fix it over here. Why you know, didn't get the duplicates? Oh. All right, so you'll use some of these refactorings like extract function, extract class to, to fix these kinds of duplications. And uncontrolled side effects are yet another problem that can happen. And it's often sloppy design that gets you there. Here's another list of code smells that have to do with classes, right? If you're, if you're writing classes in your code, like in Java, <laughs> Python, C++, JavaScript, right? Big classes. You know, what we call a God class can get you into trouble. And outside of the scope of today, but you know, meet me later if you really want to know how a God class can blow you up. Dependencies between classes. And there's, I think there's really two different versions here. One of them is the feature envy of class A is always calling class B to do some work for it. And it's, it's doing it in a way that says, class A says, I wish I could do that myself, right? And inappropriate intimacy is the case of class A is far too dependent upon internal implementation details of class B. You really haven't written a good, strong interface with class B. Um, magic numbers or magic strings, right? Here's, a, here's some code where you're actually going through a, a list of something. Oh, there are cards in a, a deck of playing cards because there's 52 of them. Well. Use a symbolic name, just don't use a number, right? Cards and deck makes, makes the intent much clearer, right? Data clump. It's a cluster of data that really wants to be a class, right? Maybe you have uh, a repeated cluster of five inputs to a bunch of your functions or a group of five data elements that are always being operated on together, right? And maybe those five things should be bundled together and put them together into a structure or a class, right? A record, something like that. Class, usually better. So I got to point you to my first book off the list here called Refactoring by Martin Fowler. And uh, this kind of really got everybody going on this. Because um, uh, what he did was he basically said, hey, here's some of the, some of the code smells. And here's some of the things we're actually doing. Now, you know, Fowler in writing this book is very, very clearly in the Agile camp because he, he, he got a lot of help from this from Kent Beck, who's uh, one of the creators of extreme programming. And so he's picking very, very small and actually very easy to do refactorings. But by having them in this catalog, it's really kind of cool. Uh, uh, important point to mention about this book is that this was the first edition all of the examples are in Java. The second edition came out about two and a half years ago, and he totally redid the book. They're all in JavaScript. But do they apply to other languages? Absolutely. OK. All right. Here's an example of a refactoring from Martin Fowler's book. And I'm, I'm grabbing the, the JavaScript version of it here. And here, what you're doing is you're printing some kind of invoice, right? Here, you have up in the right hand corner, you can see it, right? Customer owes, and then name amount and do. Okay. And you can see what it's doing is it's actually looping through a bunch of records inside this invoice object and adding those up and getting the billing date by just looking at today and saying, oh, let's go 30 days from now. Oh, that's the right 19th. Okay. Um, it's pretty straightforward inline code. Why would we want to refactor this? Well, one of the reasons is the output functions, right? You're calling all of this stuff 
and say, hey, maybe we can push this down into lower level functions. And we're gonna use the extract function refactoring. It actually makes sense to me, right? Because the, the code that's printing the header might be changing independently of the structure of the rest of the, of the uh, algorithm, right? So it's easier to handle that if this printing code, this formatting code is isolated. So let's add those two print functions, right? I'm slurping those over and here they are in the orange boxes, right? There's print banner, there's print details, very, I mean, trivially simple functions, right? And now over in the main code, ah, I just, you know, invoke them with the right arguments. And you look at that, that code on the left and yeah, that really looks simpler. And it really does a good job of explaining kind of the flow of operations. It doesn't get messed up with all of that other, other garbage there because you put it into the lower level function. Okay. Now, what we've done is just a very humble refactoring. No functionality has changed and it's a very minor structural change. Okay, we could make a bigger change, maybe across the, the entire larger application move many of the print functions into special classes, you know, uh, yeah. And think about it, you know, that would allow us to allow for different look and feel for different customers. We could say, oh, I'll have an online invoice, which we would do in HTML, of course, or we could have invoices that are separated out by sub accounts or maybe invoices in multiple languages. I mean, you're basically, once you start this refactoring stuff, you're actually paving the way by making the structure simpler. You say, oh, I've got some alternatives. Okay, here's another refactoring. As another really easy refactoring, and my original code's the one in blue up here, just these first four lines, right? And you say, oh, this is relatively simple, but it's painful because you can barely tell, right? It's almost obvious that there are two different computation algorithms actually going on in this code, right? Yeah, you're charging customers obviously different rates for, uh, let me see, I guess, summer versus non-summer, if I read this right. Hmm, any way that we could make this code easier to scan, right? How do we know if we got it right? Well, let's use the decompose conditional refactoring. And then what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll extract out this conditional, this big ugly is before and is after, and we'll just make it a, 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 a function called summer, right? Which has that conditional in it. And we'll just call summer in the green code here, right? And as long as we're doing that, well, we'll extract the computation functions as well, right? So now our, our function is, it's still simple. It's still four lines, right? but we've pushed all of the, the really bad stuff into these helpers, okay, which I like. All right, did we save any lines of code? No, did we increase clarity? You bet. And this could prepare the way for more, right? Maybe a strategy approach for customer charging, uh, more flexibility for adding other conditions, special discounts and so on. If you didn't understand that, don't worry. <laughs> all right automated refactoring. This can happen, right? You can say, I can use some tools to help me refactor, right? This is where all of this stuff got started with uh, Bill Opdyke and people who were working in small talk and they said, hey, you know, can we have some, some automated refactoring support for a relatively simple but powerful language? And um, I, I've, gotta, I, I've gotta say, you know, the tools can help, right? For things like rename variable, right? And you do some clicking and you're clicking on the declaration and it says, oh, I will find all of the uses. You know, if you have an integrated development environment, it has all that in the database and it will rewrite everything, right? Same thing with extract function. You say, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to highlight these, you know, eight lines of code and I want that to be put off into a separate function. It says, oh, okay, I'll name the function. Uh, I'll, I'll put them in there. I'll put in the right arguments. And then maybe if it's a good tool, it'll kind of scan through the rest of the code base and say, is there anybody else who's using the same, you know, set of lines and it'll try, maybe it can succeed and maybe it'll fail, but it'll try to get all of the duplicates in there. Okay. 
There's a difference between automated refactoring and automatic refactoring. And this is one of the places where if you're a manager, it's easy to get confused. You say, oh, automatic refactoring. That's what I want. I want to buy the tool that I can just, you know, <laughs> shove my, my developers aside. I'm going to shovel in the code. I'm going to turn the crank and out is going to come better refactored code. No, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> forget it, right? Because the tool doesn't select what to refactor. You do, right? You have to think about what you need to refactor, right? Right? And that, that you know, finding all the duplicate stuff is actually going to re uh, require, you know, some kind of experienced developer to go through and say, oh, you know, this looks a lot like that. You know, let's see if we can fit that in. All right. So something cool happens when you start refactoring. And this is this has long been something that's interesting, in, especially in this agile world that we're talking about. What happens when you start eliminating a lot of duplicates and dead code? Okay. Well, you will have days, right? Let's say, you know, your your team says we're gonna spend you know, Wednesday doing refactoring or Wednesday morning doing refactoring. And you plow through and you say, oh, I'm going to change this. Oh, here's some dead code. That's gone. Uh, here's some places where I want to eliminate some duplication, right? And the count of lines of code in your code base has now shrunk. Now, as is inevitable, you know, my boss comes along and she says, how productive were you today? And I have to tell her, well, I developed negative 50 lines of code today. <laughs> Unfortunately, she's very smart. And she says, oh, this is going to reduce our maintenance cost. I said, thank you. Because <laughs> most people would look at it as at this as a loss, but it's actually a gain, right? Because you're making simplification. You're also, by making that simplification, you're making it possible to add new stuff to the code later on easier because you know the you're not going to be misled by things that are really clunky things in the code i mean it's out of the scope of this talk to get into talking about it but i will mention the word technical debt right which is basically you do something clunky and you really owe it to the code to go back and clean it up but you know you often you're in too much of a hurry so you don't do it yeah uh, that's that's like that's like a whole nother talk all right Here's the third important slide. And the third important slide is, and don't panic about this one, because you will almost certainly get this right, or at least eventually. You may take a number of small refactoring steps, but then as you are working along, right, you're making your small changes, you could raise some problems. What I point out is that refactoring is essential to preserve the architecture and the algorithms of your original code, right? Because in some ways, these are fundamental to the way that your system works. And as you're making individual changes, you, know, you may not see that, you know, hey, you're, you're wrecking the, 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 the architecture of the system, right? In other words, you could blow it. <laughs> but don't fret, don't fret. And I'll, I'll explain why, right? Here's an example over here on the left, right? The left. Here's an example, you have a billing system. Now a billing system is you know, really about the creation of different kinds of documents from a database and from certain algorithms and rules to compute the document's content, right? And, and in many ways, it's a classic retail architecture problem. When you refactor code that's been set up in this billing system, you're going to do fine because most of the changes will be within one of the three big boxes, restructuring a couple of data fields, making an algorithm easier to understand, right? It's not, you're not really going to wipe out too much. But a trickier example over here on the right, right? And of course, <laughs> we've probably got a few students that are, that are listening in on this talk and they're saying, you know, well, how's this going to apply to my robots? Uh, project. And I'm saying, boy, they always give the students the tough stuff, right? Because doing robot control is trickier. The fundamental architecture in robot control is usually either command response, or it's some kind of state machine 
drunk, right? That doesn't doesn't make sense to you, you know. Hey, <laughs> don't worry. Certain kinds of refactoring changes will be relatively safe. Things like creating subcommands, you know. Oh, I'm taking it. I'm decomposing this particular command into two or three smaller commands. Yeah, making substate machines is usually okay. But on occasion, you may be trying to rewrite something that actually winds up hiding the main commands of the system. So, but don't fret, right? When this happens, you will find that problem right away, I assure you. And when that happens, you're ju you just back up to the previous version of the code, you know, before you, you made one of your refactorings and then try something else. Now, backing up is okay. It's not a sign of failure. It's a sign of learning. Cool. All right. There are other kinds of code improvements that you might consider. One of my favorites is increasing the use of standard libraries. When you're working in Java or Python, here you got languages that have wonderfully rich libraries and um, uh, well-tested, good and efficient code. And for some reason you didn't use it, right? Agile developers, sometimes forget to do things the easy way, yeah? And their friends should help them, right? They should refactor to simplify where they can. Of course, don't go overboard. Can you say, oh, I'm turning everything into library functions? No, no, use your judgment, right? It's also useful, another code improvement, is to add more tests. Refactoring to add unit tests to a legacy system that doesn't have any unit tests and is a blessing, right? Oh, and it's a hard job. And I always point people to my favorite book on this topic, which is called Working Effectively with Legacy Code by Michael Feathers. And uh, he goes through lots of examples in here in C++ and Java and shows, you know, various places. Well, one of the problems is you have to, you want to be able to drive a function in isolation from some of the things that are around it in order to have an, an effective and efficient unit test. And he shows you, you know, how you basically find the seams in the code and that you basically can wrap the tests inside. Okay. So it's the get that old code under unit test control, right? Spend a day every once in a while saying, let's, in, let's improve our set of unit tests. All right. So now we're, we're getting close to the end here. We're around to the patterns community camp. Camp three has a very different goal. Camp one, remember, wants to make fixes and new code additions simpler, right? Yeah, we know we have bugs to fix as maintenance programmers. We know that we're being asked to add new, new uh, features and we wanna do some refactoring to help pave the way for that to happen. Camp two wants to support agile and iterative development. So they're like doing a little bit of refactoring in every iteration. Camp three is about actually improving the design and in particular using some of the standard design patterns. And the book for that one is called Refactoring to Patterns by Joshua Karevsky, okay? And um, in this design level refactoring camp, basically you have a different set of design smells, things that you say, oh, I wish I could have done this differently because you know, I'm, I keep running into this problem when I want to extend this or want to debug that or I want to test this other thing. So you find some patterns and you say, what I'm really going to do is align my code so that it actually aligns to the patterns. And in some cases, your code may actually be close, right? It may already be set up to use patterns like strategy or adapter or template method or factory method or command. But, you know, if you make it clearer and you make it simpler and, and, and you make it very apparent that this is what's going on, there's going to be some positive benefits for the long-term life of your application, right? Uh, you need to identify the pattern and make it clear in the documentation of your code. Hey, I'm using command here or I'm using template method here. And then uh, once you get it documented, it's going to be more likely that the next set of developers that come along and <laughs> are going to try adjusting your code 
they're going to look at this and they say, hey, this is actually a cool design. We're going to preserve that. And we may actually be able to extend off of that. So it's a way to make the, 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 the um, design stronger and, and uh, live more flexibly. So I got to show you an example in order to make sure that this, you actually get this. All right. So here's one common design smell that's related to a code smell. The code smell is alternative classes with different interfaces. Right. Here we have, OK. Um, Different parts of this design were developed by separate teams. They often use different interface mechanisms in order to grab information from a particular data source, let's say. Okay. They may be using an external library. You know, so they're kind of you know forced into to a particular style of interface. Okay. So if you were doing ordinary refactoring, you know, you're back in, in camp one, camp two. What would you do? You would say, hmm, I am going to take interface one, interface, interface two, interface three. Yeah, I'm going to slowly refactor each one of these three interfaces. I'm going to extract new functions, change the names, and eventually every interface would look extremely similar, right? They'd look like this unified interface down here, right? But maybe we can't do this. Maybe we don't have the source code, so we can't change it, right? Or maybe another group, they own the code. Maybe requesting code changes from them would start a big fight with another department. Oh, so we act, may actually be in a situation where we're stuck with interface one, interface two, interface three. So what do we do? Well, maybe, maybe we can use a pattern. <laughs> okay, uh, well, it, it turns out, yeah. Adapter pattern is made for this problem. Keep the three interfaces, right? They're going to be the ones that are talking to and extracting information from the data sources. But what you're going to do is set up three adapter classes that communicate to those interfaces, right? And guess what? They're going to look kind of like this unified interface. And they're going to translate, you know, the setup query into whatever you know needs to be done in order to do the the stuff in this, this interface one or interface two. Okay. So these are small helper classes that are built into your application and it makes things easier for your application because you can then you know, slowly go through and unify all of the interfaces within your application's code. And the solution is not hard, right? Adapters are easy to write. They're easy to change. We can work one interface at a time, go through and say, all right, we just need to explain what we're doing. And when a new interface comes along and a new data source, we know what to do. We say, oh, we're going to write another adapter, right? And it'll look the same. All right. Camp four is legacy code analysis. And yeah, this legacy code analysis is a very different way of working with code. These people use refactoring in an interesting way. Their purpose, their idea is to use refactoring to learn. In fact, they might not actually make permanent changes to the code base. What they're doing is they're trying things out and asking questions, right? You're working with a code base that somebody else has written, you know, maybe they're in another country even, right? And you're trying to psych it out and you're trying to say, well, you know, how can I use this? How can I extend this? What am I going to strip away? <clears throat> and you say, I'm going to make a hypothesis guess as to how the, the current code works and then restructure the code to verify the guess. And then I'll put it back, right? And we do this. <laughs> Why do we do this? Well, you say, well, we could read the design documentation or we could read the code comments. But documentation and comments are not very good. Most design doc documentation for a legacy system is hopelessly old, out of date, wrong. The code is actually the best documentation. Mm. So to learn how to do this, I'm gonna point you to yet another excellent book. Um, this is called Object-Oriented Reengineering Patterns. And it's written by these, these uh, three Swiss guys. And um, I, I have the paper version of the book, but they said, you know, we like this book so much, we're gonna make it 
open an open source book, right? And then they basically put the PDF file up on a, on a web server someplace and they said, nah, it's free now, right? You don't have to buy it, just download it, right? And it's an amazing set of tools and you'll learn a lot. I'm including here on the slide, the table of contents, right? The kinds of, of um, re-engineering patterns they have. And a lot of this is exploratory refactoring, right? You're putting new probes into the middle of key functions from the classes. And they're all simple, right? But they really help you understand your code better. So summary of the four camps, right? We have software evolution, right? Refactoring selectively. We have agile development, a little refactoring in each iteration. Patterns community, you're trying to restructure the design. So it's directed refactoring. Legacy code analysis is exploratory refactoring. All right, just about at the end. Summary, you should learn more about refactoring, right? Why should you refactor? Because you can improve your own code. You can make the code that you're maintaining better. You can be more agile by including more unit tests. And this is not difficult, right? Both manual and automated refactoring are easy. You'll get better quality, you'll get easier changes, and uh, I've, I've actually got a link here to some more resources where you can learn you know, basically how to get started on refactoring for yourself. One last parting bit of advice. You can learn a lot about refactoring from the books that I showed, from online articles, whatever. And it's good to look at some of the refactoring examples to get an idea how the process works. But many of us don't actually get it until we actually use the refactoring on code we really care about. So I suggest that you start with some old code that you have lying around. Anything older than three months is good, right? You will learn something about refactoring and how to make the code clearer and more understandable. All right. And finally, here's some of the books that I referred to. And Martin Fowler's book is definitely a good catalog of refactoring ideas to try. The Refactoring to Patterns book is more advanced with some great ideas about design improvements. Note that a few of the books here don't even say refactoring in the title, but they are, right? Clean Code is about making your coding style simpler and you use refactoring in the steps to, to, uh, to, to get there. And, um, um, as I mentioned, the Working Effectively with Legacy Code is a great book about legacy refactoring. So, questions?